subconscious impulses of the soul. We have devoted the recent lectures to considering, from a certain point of view, the life that runs its course behind the ordinary life that in normal circumstances or to ordinary science is embraced by our physical consciousness. Fundamentally, all our considerations are directed to that life, which transpires under the threshold of ordinary consciousness. And we seek to characterize it from the most varied sides, as we must do in spiritual science. A certain security is connected with the external physical perceptible reality. In that, one beholds it. But physically, even for those who do not undergo the necessary training whereby they can themselves rise into the spiritual worlds, yet through illuminating these worlds from different sides that harmonize, a certain wisdom is created, and this may create a feeling of security. Special attention is drawn to the fact that human beings do not inhabit only in the world we behold with ordinary consciousness. Beneath the threshold of ordinary consciousness, a life takes place that unless one goes through the portal of initiation, is not grasped consciously. It remains unknown to ordinary human life. Much takes place in the world in relation to the whole entity that makes up a human being. What people know while living in the physical body is only one part of what actually takes place and all the efforts made to get in touch with the spiritual world consist of trying to see something of the life that transpires under the threshold of ordinary consciousness. By widening our consciousness, we try to cross the threshold and perceive what we really live in but remains imperceptible to our ordinary consciousness. As I have said, a certain adjustable threshold exists between the ordinary consciousness and what, and this expression has a certain meaning for us, we are unconsciously conscious of. In the previous lecture I gave a very pointed example. A man proposes early in the morning to accomplish something that night. He lives, as it were, in the thought that he will carry out his plan during the evening. At midday something occurs that prevents him from fulfilling his intention. To the ordinary consciousness, this occurrence would seem to be an accident. But if one looks deeper into human life, one discovers wisdom in the so-called accident, but a wisdom that lies beneath the threshold of consciousness. In the previous lecture I gave a very pointed example. A man proposes early in the morning to accomplish something that night. He lives, as it were, in the thought that he will carry out his plan during the evening. At midday something occurs that prevents him from fulfilling his intention. To the ordinary consciousness this occurrence would seem to be an accident. But if one looks deeper into human life, one discovers wisdom in the so-called accident, but a wisdom that lies beneath the threshold of consciousness. One cannot really perceive this wisdom with the ordinary consciousness, but one very frequently discovers, in such cases, that if hindrance had not occurred at midday, the man would perhaps have been brought into some disastrous situation through undertaking the proposed project during the evening. As I said, he might perhaps have broken his leg. But when one knows the connection, one discovers that wisdom lies in the entire occurrence that the soul herself sought the obstacle and put it in the way, but with intentions lying beneath the threshold of consciousness. Now that is something that is still close to the ordinary consciousness, but it points below to a region to which human beings belong, to which they belong with the concealed parts of their being, those parts that, after they lay aside the physical body, go through the gate of death. This region belongs to that ruling consciousness of which we spoke in the public lecture as the beholder of the actions of our will. This spectator is really always present, guiding and conducting us, but the ordinary consciousness knows nothing of it. 
A great deal goes on in the intervals between the events that we perceive. In all this, especially in what takes place between the events of life and in what transpires beneath the threshold of consciousness, there is prepared, as the living being is prepared in the egg, what we shall be after we have passed through the gate of death. And now, something on which we dwelt in our last consideration must be brought into connection with much that should be well known to us from earlier lectures. I have often pointed out how important and essential memory is for human beings, in so far as they stand here in physical consciousness, and that this memory should not be severed. We must remember back to a certain point in our physical experience, or at least have the power of tracing the continuity of our life. If this connecting thread is sundered, if we cannot remember definite events, so that at least we have the consciousness that we were in existence when these events took place, then a serious psychic illness appears, to which I have referred in a recent lecture. This memory forms part of our experience here in physical consciousness, but it is also, in a certain sense, a veil. It hides from us those events to which I am now referring, which lie behind the ordinary consciousness, and especially behind that veil woven by our continuous memory. Just think. First, we are infants, and then we traverse a period of consciousness that we do not recall. Next comes a time when we can always remember in later life. This begins a continuous series of memories. At a certain time in the second, third, fourth years of life, or even later for some, we must recall becoming aware of our individual self, or I. When we thus look back into ourselves, our soul gaze meets this memory. And in so far as we are physical humans here, we really live inwardly in these memories. We could not speak of ourselves as I unless we did retain this memory. All who observe themselves recognize this. When they look into themselves, they really look into the region of their memory. They regard, as it were, the tableau of their memories. Even though all we have experienced may not arise in our memory, yet we know that memories might arise, as far back as that point already described. We must presuppose that we have been consciously present with our I in all these memories and have been able to retain them. If that were not so, the continuity of our I would be disturbed and a soul disease would appear. But behind what we notice in memory there lies what is seen with spiritual eyes and heard with spiritual ears. So, what I have already explained in public lectures is absolutely correct. When we look into the spiritual world, we use the same force that we otherwise employ in memory. That does not mean that we necessarily, necessarily lose our memory on acquiring spiritual sight, but it does mean as already characterized in a public lecture, that it is not always possible to remember what we perceive spiritually. We cannot always take it in for it to live in the memory, for we must always behold it over and over and always see it afresh. I have often said, for example, that if one gives a lecture on what one really sees in the spiritual world, one cannot do this from memory in the same way as one can speak of ordinary things. For one must bring it ever again out of the spiritual world. What lives in the thought must be produced anew. Both the, the soul and the spirit must be active in such a case and must bring forth the things afresh. When spiritual seers really look into the spiritual world, what is usually the veil of memory becomes transparent, and they use it to look through. They look, as it were, through the force that otherwise fashions their memory, and look into the spiritual world. If students perform occult exercises with strength and energy, they notice that in ordinary life they use their power of thought to gain knowledge of the things and events of the world, 
with the support of the body as a physical instrument that enables them to form real conceptions of these things. The concept supported there by the activity of the physical body remains in us as a memory. When, however, we enter the spiritual world, we must be continually active in order to call forth the concepts anew. When we reach the point that I characterized in the public lecture, where one can do nothing but wait until the secrets of the spiritual world reveal themselves, a ceaseless activity begins. But one must participate in this. Just as when drawing one has to be continually active if one wishes to express anything through the drawing, similarly, when the spiritual world reveals itself, the imagination must actively cooperate. What it produces arises from the objective reality, but people must take part in this production of concepts. In this way we contact something that is continually active in humanity, in the twofold human being of which I have already spoken, but is concealed in us and lives within our physical covering beneath the threshold of our ordinary physical consciousness. One connects oneself with this being. Then one notices the following. Here in the physical world, one is so united with it that one stands on a firm basis. One sees other things in the outer world and moves about among them. One enters into certain relations with other people, to whom one does this or that and from whom one suffers this or that. We spend the life that we embrace with the ordinary consciousness in the continuous comprehension of what we develop in this way, but behind it there lies another, a life following definite laws, which we do not perceive with the ordinary consciousness. In this life we share when, between going to sleep and waking, we live in the astral body and I. Our consciousness is, however, then so lowered that we cannot perceive with ordinary senses what position we occupy in a spiritual world that pursues its own course, which continually lives around us and, while yet being supersensible and invisible, weaves itself into the sensible and visible. Above all, we must understand this world as spiritual and not think of it as a duplicate, a simply more refined, physical, sensible world. We must conceive of it as spiritual. I have often drawn attention to the reason why just in our time there must be produced from out the fountain of all human knowledge. What as carried on by us relates to the spiritual world. Truly it is clear that a certain longing is arising in humanity to open the soul to the hidden side of human life and to learn something of it. Not just because of the facts that present themselves to the spiritual investigators who have to impart truths concerning the spiritual world, but also from the whole course of our civilization. I have drawn attention to this from various perspectives. I have already presented phenomena in scientific life and elsewhere that show how this longing lives now. Today I would like to add a special example to our considerations. With it we can see that even in our time there are those who touch on these secrets of existence to a certain extent. They divine and know something of these mysteries of existence. But for reasons that we shall now examine more closely, they do not wish to approach them in the way practiced by spiritual science. The easiest way to bring such matters before people is to leave them more or less undecided by, quote, leaving the door open, close quote, saying that one does not have to believe such things or think of that world as real. Today there are plenty of examples of this. I have given instances. I shall bring forward an especial case today in reference to this point. I shall introduce into our considerations a few remarks about a really extraordinary and significant novel of modern German literature. I might call it a pearl among German novels. It is called Hofrat Eisenhardt. It is really one of the best novels of the more recent German literature. 
Footnote Alfred Freiherrn von Berge, Hofrat Eisenhardt, Court Counselor, Eisenhardt, Vienna Deutsch-Österreichische Verlag, 1911, and a footnote. In it, in a wonderful way, only a single individual is depicted, Court Counselor Eisenhardt himself. He lived in Vienna and became a lawyer and later president of the local court. He, came, he became one of the greatest lawyers of his country. He was feared by all those who had anything to do with the law, and beloved of those associated with him, for he was a most distinguished criminologist. His eloquence was such that he could get anyone convicted who came within his clutches. During the trial he subjected the defendant to a crossfire, and with a certain indifference to human life, he was able so to harass his victim, one can use this expression here, that whatever happened, he or she was trapped. Thus, this counselor Eisenhardt was a very remarkable man in his everyday life. He had little talent for entering soulful relationships with others. He was a kind of hermit with regard to human life. He laid great stress on being correct and blameless in external life. With his subordinates he exchanged but few words, but with his superiors he was not only friendly but deeply courteous. I could bring forward many more characteristics. He was a model advocate. We need not enter now into his other qualities. They are wonderfully brought out in the novel, reflected in the statement of a subordinate. But we may go to the occasion when he was once chosen to conduct an important case against a notorious man named Marcus Freund. Freund had already suffered punishment in a lesser degree for offenses similar to the one he was now accused of. But it never occurred to the examining magistrate who made the inquiry that there was any possibility of bringing about a conviction on this occasion, yet Eisenhardt obtained one. And in a document that the court counselor himself then drew up for a purpose that we shall presently disclose, he himself describes the way Marcus Freund acted during and especially after his conviction. Let me read the passage. Quote, this man who possessed the strong family affections, so characteristic of his race, had a special tenderness for a young granddaughter, of whom he was never tired of speaking with his fellow prisoners. He could hardly await his release, which he confidently anticipated, in spite of the severe suspicions laid on him, so much did he long to see the child again. Freund obstinately denied everything, and in the preliminary trial before the magistrate was so well able to explain away each of the suspicious circumstances with a sagacity truly astounding that the magistrate, a very efficient although excessively soft-hearted man, was firmly convinced of Freund's innocence until the closing proceedings began presided over by the person to whom this information refers. Close quote. Court Counselor Eisenhardt writes that, writes that himself. He writes of himself in the third person. Although Marcus Freund, even in the final trial, exerted his sagacity to the utmost, and his advocate made a beautiful and touching speech of merit even according to the newspapers, Yet the verdict was exactly the opposite to that expected by the magistrate and perhaps by the defendant himself. Freund was unanimously convicted by the jury, and as there were many previous convictions and aggravating conditions in his past, he was condemned to the severest penalty, a twenty-year prison sentence. The person concerned, none other than court counselor Eisenhardt himself, might, without presumption, consider this verdict to be one of the greatest triumphs of his many years of criminal practice. The jury would have been deceived by Freund's truly bewildering sophistry, though public feeling at that time was unfavorable toward Jews, had the President not been able, through his superior eloquence, to crumple his sophistry into nothing. The effect of the verdict on the defendant was such, the counselor himself is still relating this, that it required hardened nerves, accustomed to such outbreaks, not to be shaken as to the truth and justice of the sentence. 
First, Freund stammered a few incomprehensible words, probably in Hebrew. Then this bowed man, of barely middle height, drew himself up to his full stature, so that he appeared huge, and lifted the heavy lids that usually almost covered his eyes, showing the bloodshot whites of his rolling eyes. And from his distorted mouth he hissed a rapid stream of bitter curses and threats directed against the President. To repeat them here in the offensive jargon in which they were poured forth would hardly harmonize with the respect owed to the law. Only the first sentence may be quoted. Quote, Mr. President, you know as well as I do myself that I am innocent. Close quote. And the last. Quote, this shall be repaid to you, an eye for an eye. It shall be paid back to you. You shall see. Close quote. The rest of his speech was entirely fantastic and seemed to amount to this, insofar as it had any sense at all. Marcus Freund had probed the noble president with his eyes to the very depths and discovered that although noble, the president was unaware of it. He was nevertheless of the same sort as himself. He, the downtrodden, but this time innocent, Freund. The officers immediately did their duty and seized the offender, to whom the president immediately awarded disciplinary punishment for his outburst. While the soldiers, each holding one of his waving arms, led the accused away, his fury broke out in weeping and sobbing. Even in the corridor one heard his dull moaning, My poor, poor little girl, you will never see your grandfather again. The jury was greatly distressed at this incident and questioned the president through their foreman as to whether it would not be possible to try the case again immediately. Through their insufficient knowledge of the law, they had not enough experience to know that outbursts of this kind occur more often with hardened, blameworthy criminals than with innocent defendants, or really are much scarcer than the sensational minds of the public imagine. Less excusable was the fact that the above-mentioned soft-hearted vice-president, who was present at the pronouncement of the sentence and its disagreeable sequel, took upon himself to say to the prosecutor, gently shaking his head, quote, Mr. President, I do not envy you your talent. Close quote. So, Marcus Freund was now imprisoned, and the court counselor lived on. But how he lived and what now happened, he relates in his statement. We must presuppose that some considerable time has elapsed, and the accused had been a long time in prison. Now the following occurred. Just as the person in question, the court counselor, relates this of himself, had seen him at the moment when he uttered those threats and curses against him, with a face distorted with fury, precisely so did the long-forgotten Marcus Freund come before his mind in the night between March 18 and 19 at two o'clock, when he suddenly awoke without cause. Thus the court counselor wakes up suddenly during the night between March 18 and 19 at two o'clock and has the impression in his mind that Marcus Freund was standing before him. And while he lay motionless as in a trance, the above-mentioned events recapitulated themselves in imagination with lightning speed. He was not clearly conscious whether in the intervening years he had thought much about the occurrence or not. Both alternatives appeared equally correct to him at that moment, for horror weakened his power of thought. Thus, Councillor Eisenhardt woke up in the middle of sleep, was forced to think of Marcus Freund and to recapitulate what had happened. But he did not know whether he had previously often thought of it or not. Quote, While he lay thus with throbbing heart, an impulse arose immediately to light the candle on the table, but he could not. He could not move his hands. It was as if something gently tapped at the bedroom door, or rather a timorous scratching, as if a little dog was begging to be let in. The question formed itself automatically, who is there? There was no answer, nor did the door open, but nevertheless he had a feeling that something slipped in. The floor creaked slightly, the sound passing across the room from the door to the bed, as if this invisible something came nearer, 
and finally stood close to him. In any case, he had the indescribable feeling of a strange presence, and not of an indefinite, unknown presence, but it seemed to him as if this something must be that Marcus Freud. The sudden recollection of whom had roused him out of deep sleep. He even felt as if this invisible presence bent over his face. Now whether he fell asleep again, without being aware of it, and dreamed, and as you know dreams and the people about whom one dreams are frequently confused with one another, or whether certain exaggerated ideas of Schopenhauer as to the secret identity of all individuals stirred in him as the after-effects of what he had been reading during the last few days, at any rate, the senseless thought flashed through his mind that he and Marcus Freund were fundamentally one and the same person. And as if in confirmation of this idea, silly as it was, and contrary to all logic, he repeated, whether merely inwardly or outwardly and audibly he knew not, the previously mentioned curses and threats of Marcus Freund, as far as he could remember them and indeed with the horror-struck feeling that each curse was now beginning to fulfill itself. Whether he had fallen asleep and dreamt, which was possible, it is certain that he awoke with this terrible impression and lit a candle. The clock showed ten minutes past two. Everything in the room was as before, though furniture, walls and pictures appeared strange to him, and he had to drink a glass of water and wait a while to recover himself and realize where he was. He relates all this himself and says that first he had this vision, as we may call it. Now this made such an impression on him that he was driven to go immediately, though still somewhat shaken, to the court and look up the documents relating to Marcus Freund. But he was not able to do so. Something else occurred. Councillor Eisenhardt had always been a quiet, open-minded man, and he merely relates what happened to him. We shall shortly see why he relates it. Indeed, he considers himself somewhat ridiculous and unworthy to have yielded to it. In vain he told himself how absurd and ridiculous his conduct was. His former iron will was weakened in this sense, and remained so. It was barely enough to hide the inner torments always with him from his colleagues. One morning he thought he heard the name of Marcus Freund as he passed a group of legal officials engaged in heated conversation in a dark corridor. One day, when he went to the courthouse, he really lacked the courage again to take up these documents, but in passing the corridor, where several people were conversing, he heard the name of Marcus Freund. Now, as this man and his name had gradually become a fixed idea in his mind and never gave him any rest, he regarded a self-deception as not unlikely. And he stopped and asked the gentleman of whom they had been speaking, quote, Of Marcus Freund, of your Marcus Freund, Mr. Court Counselor, don't you remember him? Close quote, answered one of the gentlemen, who happened to be the soft-hearted magistrate who at the time had made that rash remark. Quote, of Marcus Freund? Why? What has happened to him? Close quote. He could hardly breathe. Quote, Why, he is dead. By the grace of God, the poor devil is now free, close quote. the soft-hearted one answered. Quote, dead? When? Oh, uh, close quote, end quote again. Oh, he died during the night between March 18th and 19th at 2 o'clock, close quote. Thus the story relates that court counselor Eisenhardt had convicted Marcus Freund, who was serving a long prison sentence. In the night between March 18 and 19, Eisenhardt awakes sees Freund in his thoughts, and then has a vision of his appearance. He is terribly frightened, wants to look up the documents, but allows several weeks to pass. Finally, he overhears a conversation, whereby he learns that Marcus Freund died at the very time he appeared to him, creeping into his room like a little dog. To understand all that has been related, we need the conclusion of the novel, which shows that the court counselor was now urged by circumstances, indeed by circumstances that one would not think might affect him in this way, as president of an especially important trial, in a case of espionage, he was necessarily brought into contact with certain people. 
Now in his connection with them, and guided by a faint instinct, he is led to commit the very same offense he had convicted Freund of. Later, after he had been dragged by passion into crime, he had a chance to remember in a special way the words Freund spoke after his trial, quote, This will be repaid to you, an eye for an eye, you will see. Close quote. Thus something had lived beneath the threshold of the counselor's consciousness that was definitely connected with his previous deeds, and that was also connected in a remarkable and mysterious way with the fulfillment of what the dead man had threatened him with. Indeed, there is an even deeper connection. The author of the novel wrote in the first person, as though many of the things about court court counselor Eisenhardt had been related to him personally, and he writes that he had a conversation with one of his subordinates. This conversation occurs in the novel. And this subordinate, who was an extraordinarily, excuse me, an extraordinary, sagacious, philosophically inclined man, said, quote, the, This court counselor was especially gifted with the power to penetrate to the depths of these things, because he had a strong disposition toward them himself. And so he penetrates deepest into the cases that appeal to him most. Close quote. That is related in the novel. Now, it is interesting that at two o'clock, during the night of March 18 and 19, a thought arises in the court counselor, quote, you and this Marcus Freund are practically identical, close quote. This unity, this uniting of the consciousness, appears evident to his soul. He has an insight into a connection that lies beneath the threshold of ordinary life. This is revealed to him. Naturally, it is not revealed to him in the same way as to others, for cases vary, but this disclosure comes to him. Now, it is interesting that the author of this novel has brought together all the materials possible to make the event comprehensible. And we must also recollect what this author mentions as preceding the vision that the court counselor had during the night. The court counselor was really a robust man, as has been said. Many characteristics could be brought forward that show him to be a man who did not go soulfully through life, but was one who pursues his way with a sort of brutality caused by a certain inner robustness. Only, as it were, through an outer symptom could this man, who had never been led astray and was always sure of himself, become a wrongdoer. The outer cause was this. He discovered a tooth had become loose and that he could easily remove it with his fingers. The thought then flashed through his head, quote, My life is now on the wane. Something has begun to decay. Close quote. He could not get the thought out of his head. This is how I will gradually lose my health. That would not have been so bad. The worst was that from that moment, though he did not notice it but ruminated over his own decay, as he himself shows in his letters, wherein he describes himself in the third person, from that moment on his memory began to fail. His memory had been such a help in all his professional work that he develops anxiety about life. He notices that he could no longer remember certain things that he used to recall so easily. Consider how interesting it is that the novelist presents the possibility of developing a partial clairvoyance as memory begins to decline. Then his memory improves again. He decides to record this and remembers his previous state. As a free thinker, he must suppose that all this was a part of a diseased condition, and he reflects, quote, I am actually in danger of going crazy. Close quote. This conclusion would be natural for a free thinker. He is too ashamed to seek advice and thus takes advantage of his position to write in the third person. He then places the document before a psychiatrist as the case of some unknown person, and thus he hoped to get medical advice. Thereby the novelist uses this document to impart something of the soul life of this man. You see that we have here a really beautiful work of art, which indeed points to those elements of which we have to speak in spiritual science. Just those elements of which one speaks when dealing with the connection between the power of memory and the perception into the spiritual worlds. 
The novelist accomplishes that beautifully by causing the memory to fail the moment certain shreds of these secret connections become evident to this person. The whole narrative is quite extraordinary. It is so constructed in its various parts so that we realize that the author recognizes such connections behind life, but he clothes that knowledge in the form of novel. The novel is very cleverly written and could be written only by a philosophical mind. It is written by one who was the manager of the Hamburg Theater for many years and who later became manager of the Burgtheater in Vienna. This novel is really not only one of the best he has written, but it is one of the pearls of German fiction. Of course, I am not saying this because it is written around a subject that is deeply interesting to us, but because only a person of very fine perception could have such delicate observation in a seemingly abnormal way. What I have said about the merit of this book is purely from an artistic perspective. It is really written so that the reader is aware that the author has written a novel, but it is so well written that he might as well have written a biography of court counselor Eisenhardt. We see in such a novel that Berger must have known a man who really had such experiences in life. One cannot help saying how natural it would be for a person such as Alfred von Berger to approach the spiritual world so that through spiritual science he might come to know the real connections. How infinitely important would it be for Berger to have studied spiritual science so that he might have been able to say, for example, quote, what will court counselor Eisenhardt have to experience in the time immediately after passing through the gates of death in what we have always called Kamaloka, after having caused an innocent man to be convicted. Close quote. As I have told you, we must then experience the effects of our actions and the significance that those acts have for others in connection with them. What the court counselor had done at the trial afforded him a tremendous satisfaction at the time, especially his great power of oratory. He had satisfaction, which he expressed by saying, quote, He considered it meritorious that he prevailed against the sophistry of the prisoner and gave a speech that urged the jury to convict him, though they regretted it immediately afterward when they saw the effect of their verdict on the accused. Close quote. This is how it was seen from this side of the court counselor. From the side of Marcus Freund, it is a very different matter where we see the effect of the sentence on him. The court counselor has to experience the effect of this on his soul in Kamaloka. A reflection, a picture of this, reveals itself at the very moment when Freund himself goes through the gates of death. This is disclosed to him in such a way that he now sees himself as identical and one with this Marcus Freund. He sees himself in Marcus Freund. He feels himself also within him. We see that the court counselor had a foretaste of Kamaloka. This is so powerful that he not only experiences what had happened previously, but also something intimately connected with the whole matter transpires further in him beneath the threshold of his consciousness. Each single detail is important. I told you that he had lost his memory for a while, during which this part of the spiritual world unveiled itself to him. Now, however, a time comes when he is endowed anew with a great natural power of memory. Memory reinstates itself in him when he tried the case of espionage. But during this very trial he is driven to commit the same offense for which he had caused, through his eloquence, Marcus Freund to be convicted. The force that previously arose from memory was transformed into the force of instinct, and this drives him. He no longer sees the connection that was working subconsciously between what he was now doing and what he had ascribed to Freud. This leads to the following. Counselor Eisenhardt, when he sees what has happened to him, goes into his office the very evening preceding the conclusion of the lawsuit in which he was to accomplish his greatest triumph. Having entered his office, the key to which he had with him, 
He lit the two candles on the writing table, washed his hands, face, and hair. Then he changed his civilian attire for his uniform and paced up and down for a long time. Then he opened the top drawer of his writing table and from a parcel withdrew a new revolver and a pack of cartridges that he had probably bought during the worst period of his nervous breakdown. He carefully loaded all the chambers and took a sheet of official paper from the paper rack and wrote, quote, In the name of His Majesty the Kaiser, I have committed a serious offense and feel unworthy to exercise my office further or to live any longer. I have condemned myself to the severest punishment and in the next few minutes shall execute the same with my own hand. Eisenhardt, Vienna, June 10, 1901. Close quote. Neither the writing nor the signature betrayed even the slightest nervousness. Next morning he was found dead. A quite remarkable connection is described in this novel, and we must say that the author was well qualified to see the connection existing between what transpires here in the ordinary consciousness and what happens beneath the threshold of consciousness. That is, he could see the spiritual events in which humanity is entangled. Exoterically, one only sees the happenings of the physical world. That the judge convicted Marcus Freund, and so on. If that had not happened, just at that time when the lawyer became confused and lost his memory, he would not have seen these threads of the spiritual world. They would not have revealed themselves to him. And all this would have remained subconscious. A novel such as this is sent out into the world from the following perspective, so to speak. There is certainly something behind life that in certain special cases cannot but be recognized. However, if one speaks of this, people do not like it. It is uncomfortable to approach such realities. So it is related as a novel, and then nobody need believe it. If it merely amuses people, that is all right. Now what holds people off from the spiritual world is something of which they are not aware. The way into the spiritual world goes, as it were, in two directions. In the first, we push aside the veil of nature and investigate what lies behind the phenomena of external nature. In the second, we push through the veil of our own soul life and seek what lies behind that. The ordinary philosophers also seek to probe behind the basis of existence. They seek to solve the cosmic mystery. But note, how do they do this? They either observe nature directly or through experiments and then think it over afterward. But while one puzzles out these ideas acquired through the knowledge of nature, turning them over and over again in one's mind and interlacing them, one does certainly arrive at a philosophy, but not at anything really connected with the true outer reality. We can never get behind the veil of existence by reflecting on what presents itself in outer nature. I expressed this as follows in a public lecture, quote, What causes our eternal forces is active, in that it first produces in us the instrument with which we approach our ordinary consciousness. Close quote. However, if we are to build up our ordinary consciousness, we must use this instrument, when we enter the experience of ordinary consciousness, everything that the eternal forces make in us is already completed. Hence, when we reach this stage through meditation, we notice that we cannot penetrate the secrets of nature by means of reflection, but by quite different means. If, as I have described in my public lectures, we strengthen our thought through meditation, and the revelation of the spiritual world comes to us through grace, we then behold nature quite differently. Even human life itself has a different aspect then. We then approach nature, and while taking in any process or object or event that meets us, we have at the same time the consciousness, quote, before you really see a rose, something else takes place. Close quote. True. You first see the perception the realization, 
but that perception has first fashioned itself. Into the perception is inserted the spiritual. Therein lies the memory, the memory of the previous thought. To get behind the secret in this way through spiritual research, that is the secret. Philosophers observe the rose and then philosophize about it in their rejections. But those who want to get behind the secret of the rose may not reflect. If they do, nothing happens. They must observe the rose and be aware that before it comes through to their sense consciousness, some process has already taken place. It appears to them as a memory that preceded the perception. The whole matter turns on this, that something like a memory transpires, which tells us, quote, I did this before I reached the sensible perception, so that as regards external nature, a previous thinking has taken place, although it remains subconscious, and then it is brought to the surface as a memory, close quote. One cannot penetrate the secrets of nature through afterthought but through forethought. Nor can one penetrate the secrets of what fills the soul in any way other than by truly approaching the spectator of whom I have often spoken. Note well, these are the ways by which we can enter the spiritual world today. You will recall that in the novel a shred of the spiritual world reaches court court counselor Eisenhardt's perception after he realized the processes of decay in himself. And this is a peculiar illustration of what I have brought forward in my lectures. When our thinking is so strengthened by our exercises that we can see the spiritual world, we are immediately confronted with the process of destruction, with what is connected with death. Mystics of all ages have expressed this by the phrase, quote, to approach the gate of death, close quote. That is, all that manifests as destruction in human life. If we have really carried our meditation to the point where we attain the experience of initiation, we experience this, quote, I stand at the gate of death. I know there is something in me that has prevailed since my birth or conception, which then concentrates itself and becomes the phenomenon of death, the confiscation of the physical body, close quote. One then makes reply, quote, but all that leads to death, has come from the spiritual world. What has come from the spiritual world has united itself with what arises from the hereditary substance. We see a man standing here in the physical world and and say, what confronts us is his countenance, which speaks to us through his words. Everything he does as physical human being is the expression of what prepared itself in the spiritual world through his last death and birth. His soul being lives in this. And from the whole bearing of these considerations, we can conclude that the part of the human soul that lives between death and rebirth attracts the forces out of the spiritual world to fashion human beings in the incarnation between birth and death, to build something that is just the persons themselves. Then it is true that through meditating on the will, the seed is evolved that again goes through the gate of death to prepare itself in the spiritual world for a next incarnation. Thus in humanity there lies this eternal process of growth. The psychic spiritual descends from the spiritual world and forms a human being here in whom arises at first as a mere speck what now originates here as in life as the seed. And this again goes through the gates of death in order to continue its evolution. So that when we have human beings here, it is really evident that as they stand before us, they as humans have been created from out of the spiritual world. With that provided by the parents, there unites itself with what descends from the spiritual world. While they were in the spiritual world, they were among the spiritual powers. Just as here in the physical body, they are among the forces of nature. 
They were among the spiritual forces, and with their help they prepared themselves for this incarnation. When we see a human being incarnate before us, it truly is as I have represented in the second mystery play, The Soul's Probation, that whole worlds of divine beings work in order to produce human beings. Between death and rebirth, spiritual forces are operative in order to maintain the human being. People here are the goal of certain spiritual forces that are active between death and rebirth. Now note, this leads to spiritual science. But it has always been known and brought to expression. For example, a man of note expressed what I have said over and over again by saying, quote, late in the human, excuse me, life in the human body is the ultimate aim of the path of the gods, close quote. He meant that when we are in the spiritual world woven into the world of the gods between death and rebirth, we prepare ourselves for our incarnation, for our body. That is the object of the divine path. He was unable, however, to add the other sentence, quote, in the body a new beginning is prepared, which then again goes through death and leads to a new incarnation, close quote. This phrase, quote, the life in the body is the ultimate aim of the divine path, close quote, forms to a certain extent the leading motive, motive of all the works written by Christoph Ettinger, a very noted man, nearly a hundred years ago. He drew attention continually to the path that human knowledge and perception must take if it is to recognize these spiritual connections. What anthroposophy really desires can already be found in the older theosophists, but Ettinger wishes to present it in his own way. His editor wrote some beautiful words at the end of his preface in 1847. He wanted to express that in the past people sought the spiritual path, but in their own way. But that, at a, ta- but that a time would come, fairly soon when what one had always sought would be grasped with full scientific consciousness. His editor says, quote, The essential point is that when theosophy becomes a real science and brings definite results, these will gradually become the universal conviction of humanity. Yet this rests in the bosom of the future, which we do not wish to anticipate. Close quote. Thus spoke Richard Walter, the Heidelberg professor, referring to the theosophist Christoph Edinger in November 1847. What spiritual science strives for has already existed, but in a different form. Today it is necessary to find it in exactly the best form for our time. As I have often said, the thought of natural science today has reached a perspective from which the right scientific form must be sought, from the method of that science herself, for what lived in theosophy of all times. Close quote. When Walter, as Ettinger's editor, says that what the latter implies, quote, rests in the bosom of the future, close quote, we must remember that what in 1847 was the future has certainly matured into the present in our time. We are confronting time when we can prove, for it was but one example that I have brought before you today in the novel titled Hofrat Eisenhardt by Alfred von Berger, that human souls are really ripe to approach the spiritual truths, but that they morally lack the courage to grasp them in reality. I said that in two directions lies the path to the spiritual world, in which one can see behind the veil of nature. For those who are accustomed to thinking scientifically, and who merely have to raise their scientific thought to an inner instrument in the way described, Why is it so difficult to make progress? Why? They say that there are limits to human knowledge. Ignoramus et ignorabimus. Why do they not wish to enter the spiritual world? Well, the reason for that lies beneath the threshold of their consciousness. Within the sphere of consciousness, so-called logical reasons are brought forward as to why human beings cannot enter the spiritual world. These arguments have long been known, but beneath these logical reasons is to be found the true inner reason 
the fear of the spiritual world. This fear of the spiritual world holds people back, but they are not aware of it. If they could only acquaint themselves with the existence of this unconscious fear and how everything presented in opposition is merely a mask, hiding the fear in its reality, they would become aware of many things. That is the one thing. The other is that as soon as people enter the spiritual world, they are seized upon. Just as we can grasp their thoughts here, they are seized by the beings of the higher hierarchies. Human beings become, as it were, a thought in the spiritual world. Against this the soul inwardly struggles. It is frightened, terrified, and shrinks from being taken possession of by the spiritual world. Again, a question of fear, a powerless terror of allowing itself to be laid hold of by the spiritual world, in the way in which at birth one is laid hold of by the physical forces. Thus outer fear and dread of a certain powerlessness to resist being seized by the spiritual world, this it is that holds people back from it. That is why they so often wish, as the author in this novel, to splash in the waves of the spiritual world without, as I might say, binding themselves in any way. That is why they have not really the courage to draw too near to the spiritual world, lest it should lay hold of them, as may truly happen through the inner experiments often described, just as the apprehension of the secrets of nature may come about through external experiments. If, to what has been said, you apply what was brought forward in one of the public lectures concerning this connection between the forces of genius that appear in life and premature death brought about by a person's body being taken away through a shell or some other cause on the battlefield, if in connection with what has been said you remember that the forces of genius or of invention appear in human beings as the effect of those processes, that occurred when they were deprived of their physical body, then there also you have something remaining beneath the threshold of consciousness. But in their courage, in the whole way in which people offer themselves up for some great event of the time, there lies an instinctive expression of something resting beneath the threshold of consciousness, and that is unable to reach their consciousness in its full significance. Nevertheless, in our time, there is in human evolution an impulse to carry up to the threshold of consciousness what lies beneath it, so that humans may know something of it. And when I point to the fact that even in the great events of our time, in all that transpires in full consciousness, especially in the events of this epoch, there lie significant subconscious processes, I mean this to be taken in the above-mentioned sense. For what these events are inserting into the great connection of human beings will never be included in what the external historian can grasp of these present events. More than ever before does the subconscious play a part in the present happenings. Therefore the spiritual investigator is allowed to indicate that a time will come in the future when in order to behold the present significant historical events in the right light of their cosmic connections, we shall point to their spiritual background. With this in view, the words with which we now always conclude will be more and more present to our souls. Quote, from the fighter's courage, from the blood of battles, from the mourner's suffering, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruits of spirit if, with consciousness, the soul turns her thought to spirit realms.